Well, good morning. Good morning. I, uh, since, since Pastor Melanie has been feeling a little under the weather, the strep throat, talking isn't always the easiest thing to do, and, and so uh, I jumped at the chance to be able to speak again with you, um, and so here I am, and um, back in September of 2014, I happened to be out in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I was visiting my dad. He was doing some renovation work on a house. And if you've ever been to Colorado Springs, you know that no matter where you are in the city, whether you are south of town near the airport or north of town near the Air Force Academy, if you look up and to the west, you'll see Pikes Peak absolutely towering over the city. And uh, Pikes Peak is, is a mountain. Uh, we may not be as familiar with those in these parts, but mountains are very big. And as I looked up at the top of Pikes Peak uh, one day, I, I thought aloud, I'd really like to try to climb a 14er. Uh, a 14er, by the way, is, uh, that's, that's, the, that's short for 14,000 feet. Uh, there are 53 14ers in the state of Colorado, and and people uh, like to put themselves through the torture of climbing them. And so as I, as I saw the top of Pikes Peak, I thought, I'd really like to try to do that. And as I thought that aloud, my dad replied, well, give me about a year's notice, and I'll get myself ready, and, and I'll, I'll try to go with you. And I said, okay, this is your year's notice. We passed this really fun idea along to my brother, and he joined the crew, and suddenly the three of us were making plans. Um, now, when I say the three of us were making plans, I'm the baby of the family. I was making plans. This was going to be my trip. And, and being the good sports that they are, they, they just went right along with it. And the first thing that I did, the first part of the plan that I made, was to choose which mountain we were going to climb. With 53, 14 years to choose from, I wanted to make sure that I got the easy one. <laughs> um, and so, so I researched and I asked helpful, uh, resourceful, knowledgeable people, and we got, to, uh, we got to Quandary Peak in Breckenridge. And so in 2015, that was the mountain we were going to climb. The trail wasn't too long. Um, there, there weren't any, uh, there, there was no exposure or, or cliffs or anything like that really to speak of. It was going to be a safe mountain to climb, and it was going to be an easy trail. So that was a good choice for beginners, and that's the mountain we were going to go with. The next thing I had to do was figure out what it was actually going to take to climb a 14,000-foot mountain. Uh, my family and I were from West Virginia, and those wild and wonderful West Virginia hills are absolutely monstrous next to the Lake Wales Ridge. <laughs> but when you pale, when you put them up against uh, the Rocky Mountains, they kind of pale in comparison. And climbing is very different. And so, as I read through some advice for first-time 14er climbers, uh, one of the first things I learned about was this idea of acclimatization. That's getting your body ready for the altitude of the Rockies, going from basically sea level here in Florida. To 6,000 feet is drastic enough. Uh, 6,000 feet is about where Colorado Springs is. But then going from 6,000 feet to 14,000 feet, that can really mess your body up. And so, uh, you know, once you reach actually 8,000 feet, uh, your body starts going through these physiological changes. Uh, the, the oxygen level at 8,000 feet is so drastically different than below that um, the, the oxygen in your blood isn't, isn't as much, so there's not enough oxygen getting to your muscles. You start experiencing muscle fatigue, uh, lightheadedness, nausea, all kinds of things, and that's just the beginning of altitude sickness. And we wanted no part of that, so I wanted to make sure we were, we were ready to go on that front. In order to prepare, we were going to have to spend at least a week in Colorado Springs before 
and spend some time above 8,000 feet and below 8,000 feet to just get our bodies ready. And then the next thing we wanted to do is make sure we had our trail legs. And so that week uh, I had planned doing some, some little hikes around Colorado Springs to make sure that we were ready to go, make sure that, that our legs were strong enough, that we were going to hit the trail running. And, uh, and, and we even did uh, a, a hike of the Great Sand Dunes National Park, which is a real leg workout. Imagine walking on the beach uphill uh, for about two miles and gaining about 750 feet of elevation. That, that'll wear your legs out. And so I wanted to make sure everything was planned. I even planned how much time it was going to take us to climb Quandary Peak because we didn't want to spend too much time above uh, 8,000 feet. We wanted to make sure we were up and back and we were going to be good and safe and not have altitude sickness. And so I figured the trail was about seven miles round trip. And you know, if you're walking on a pretty level path, three miles an hour is about walking pace. And so, you know, we're going to be going uphill. Let's say we'll do one mile an hour. That's conservative enough. One mile an hour and going downhill, we may, you know, the whole thing should take us about six hours. Okay. So six hours and done. And as I plan and I gave my dad and my brother all these plans, I'm sure they rolled their eyes a few times, but again, they just went right along with it and they spent months regularly going to the gym and getting their cardio in and strengthening their legs and, and uh, probably turning the incline on the treadmill up as far as it would go. And, and, and we prepared ourselves, I think, about as well as we could have. And finally, the morning of the hike came early. Uh, again, I wanted to make sure that we were up and back. And so we hit the trail at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I was energized, and I was ready to go. And I think we all were. We were really excited. I don't think any of us slept that well, but we were really, really excited. And into the dark we traveled. Now, at the, at the trailhead, there's this sign there. And on the sign, it says, there are no easy 14ers. <laughs> But really and truly, for the first mile or so, it, it wasn't so bad. I mean, it was, it was uh, we probably went a little slower than I wanted, but it wasn't so bad. We just kept going one foot in front of the other, and, and, and in reality, it was dark, so we couldn't see really how fast we were going or anything like that. We just knew that we were going to keep going, and we could handle the next step. But as... As the sun started coming up, we started looking up, and we started seeing how far we had to go. And the trouble was, my dad was 57, and even though he had worked really, really hard to prepare for this trip, climbing a mountain is very, very hard. And so, as we climbed higher and higher, his heart started beating faster and faster. And his breathing became more and more difficult. And I don't want to paint the wrong picture. He wasn't hyperventilating or anything like that. But we just had to stop an awful lot so that we could catch our breath, so that we could all lower our heart rates, and that we'd be ready for the next leg of the trip. So we'd climb 50 feet and stop and take a breath. And then we'd climb 50 feet and stop and take a breath. And as the day wore on, it became more and more obvious that we were going to be on that mountain a lot longer than I planned. In fact, my dad was wearing down, and we all had these moments as we stopped and took a breath where we thought, this is taking an awfully long time. I don't, I don't know. Maybe we should turn around. But more than once, my dad said, I just don't know that I'm going to do it. And so we started getting really, really discouraged. At one point, I was about 50 feet, uh, 50 feet ahead, and I was looking back down uh, a little ways at my brother and my dad who had stopped to, to take a breath. Uh, and as I waited, my brother caught up and said, 
All right, Dad said he's going to turn around and go back down to the car. Uh, said for us to go on ahead. Now, I think about this story in the midst of the Advent season for, for a couple reasons. First, I think about the work that we do together as a community of faith. I think about the work of the church, the work of ministry, and what a mountain it can be. And, you know, we plan and we prepare and we do all the things we can in order to get ourselves ready to hit the trail. But there are always, inevitably, things that aren't calculated, things we aren't prepared for. No matter if it's, uh, for, for me, organizing the fall festival or, or planning Wednesday night dinners or being a part of the visitation team or any number of the ministries that are undertaken by this church and by the people of this church, there are things that can easily arise that we weren't expecting. And it can become discouraging. Sometimes even we look around at our world, both our immediate context here in Lake Placid, and we look around at the whole world and we see all the sadness and all the hurt and all the darkness and all the pain. And as we see all of these things, it becomes this massive mountain. And it's one thing whenever we can focus on the thing that's right in front of us, like my dad and brother and I in the dark. We can handle the next step, but when we take a step back and look at the whole mountain, it can become really discouraging really quickly. Even personally, within our families, Christmas time, this time of year can seem so overwhelming. Parents this time are under a tremendous amount of stress. They're hoping to match their kids' Christmas experience with whatever the latest Hallmark movie is they watched. And, and everyone knows this phenomenon. Everyone's familiar with this phenomenon by now of, of the hottest Christmas present of the year. And parents are under the stress to get the hottest Christmas present of the year for their kid because every kid wants it. And so they'll pay like 10 times as much for this present as it normally would cost so that their kids can have the right kind of Christmas experience. And then there are the parents who can't afford to do that or anything like that for their kids. And so parents who feel like absolute failures because their kids are asking for the same thing as every other kid. But there's no way they can make it happen. And, and the presents, that's just one part of the Christmas time craziness. Schedules are absolutely crazy for everyone. We've got classroom Christmas parties, work Christmas parties, parades, plays, events, all of the things that come with, with being just in our culture within Christmas season. And the school semester is coming to a close, so parents and students and teachers are struggling to make sure everything's done before the Christmas break. And we've got to make sure that the house is clean before family arrives. And we've got to make sure we've got all the right food in the house and it's cooked to perfection. And all of these things to match what we think Christmas ought to be. And there's just never enough time. And so there's always this stress around Christmas, this mountain around Christmas of stress. And some of us live that life. And then there are others of us that are alone that feel so lonely during this time of year. The holidays are particularly a difficult time for people who have suffered loss. And sometimes it seems as though there's this mountain of sadness that looms over the season. And so with everything that goes on in the Christmas season, it's not uncommon that people in every circumstance will become overwhelmed and feel like they just need to stop and take a breath. In fact, it's not uncommon for, for people to begin to feel like, I just don't know that I can do it. This week, our, our scripture reading comes from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. And, and as, I read through, as I read through this this week, I felt the warmth of Paul's words to these people. It was as though he actually 
knew them, he did. And he actually knew where they were and what their struggles were and simply wanted to give them these words of encouragement. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 24, he closes his letter by saying this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. You see, the Thessalonians were, uh, were, were people. They were humans. And they were struggling with these real life issues. They were struggling with, within their home. They had struggles within their community of faith. Struggles within their government. Struggles with the stress of trying to live in the culture that surrounded them. More specifically, when Paul began the church at Thessalonica, he began with, within the Jewish synagogue there. The Jewish faithful then, I mean, can you imagine? You have, you have a community of faith, and here comes someone who has a new teaching that undermines or seems to undermine the faith that you've been brought up with. And so they were, they were understandably upset. All of this taking place within their very walls and people were converting to follow this Jesus. And so the response from the Jewish leaders was to start to, to raise charges against the Christians there. See, Paul came and started the church and then he moved on to the next place because that's what Paul did. And the leaders that were there were brought before Roman courts under charges of political insurrection. So, to say the least, the young Christians and the Jewish faithful there were, were struggling against one another in some pretty stressful, pretty major ways. Pretty life-changing ways for, for both parties, really. But, but the Christians were facing some real intense persecution from the Jewish faithful and from the Roman government. Not only that, but, but Thessalonica was, was kind of at a crossroads of Roman culture. Literally right along a major military road. And it was also a port city. And so being a trade center, there were people from all different cultures coming through. And this influenced the culture that surrounded the young Christians there. And you can imagine with all of that surrounding them, how distracted it could become. How distracted and discouraged they could become. <laughs> About the mission of the good news of Jesus Christ when there's always someone else who is combating the message of Jesus Christ. So it's within this context that Paul is writing to the church. With the difficulties you guys face, he says, it's easy to become distracted and discouraged. It's easy to lose the heart of ministry. It's easy to lose the joy that's to be found in the coming of Jesus Christ. And so to us, he says, it's easy to become distracted and discouraged. It's easy to lose the joy that's to be found in the coming of Christ Jesus. When, when we look around at the hustle and the bustle and all the things that need to be accomplished, when we look around at the division and the impatience that people have for one another, sometimes we even partake. In that impatience or that division. It's easy to become distracted. It's easy to grow cynical. And we allow our joy to fade away. Paul chooses his words to the Thessalonians very carefully. Because he has great care for them. And sometimes we read scripture so quickly. 
because – and we just begin to assume that the writers wrote it just as quickly, but he chose his words so carefully, understanding what was facing the Thessalonians. So here are his words again. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks for all circumstances. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who is faithful, he will surely do it. Back on that mountain three years ago, as my brother had just told me, my dad was going to turn around. There was a gentleman who had passed us probably at about 7 that morning, three hours after we began. He passed us going up, and he was on his way back down. And, and this gentleman was probably, uh, I guessed him to be older than, than my dad was. Uh, he passed my brother and me, and they went down, and he talked with my dad for a little while. And, uh, and then my dad stood up, and he caught up to us, and he had told him we were about a half mile away, that, uh, and which is awfully tough to see on the side of a mountain. You never know when you're going to hit the next fall summit. But that last half mile was, was grueling. The, the worst part, the hardest part. But we were almost there. And that was enough for my dad to keep going. So probably an hour later, seven hours after we began the hike, we reached, the, all three of us made it to the top at 14,265 feet to the top of Quandary Peak. And there were so many times where I felt, I doubted, that we would never make the top. There were so many times where the joy of being on that journey, the joy of being on that path was overshadowed by the mountain itself. But in reality, all the three of us needed to keep doing was to take a moment to breathe, find our joy in the midst of the struggle, and keep moving forward. Today, this Advent, this Christmas time, you might be struggling. Uh, you might be, uh, if, if perhaps it's your health or, or loneliness, grief, pain, just feeling overwhelmed by the season, by all that needs to be done. Maybe, maybe you're thinking about what God's called you to do. Maybe you're thinking about your role in ministry, and you've become so discouraged by that ministry and what needs to be done that thinking it can't be done, no matter what your struggle is this morning, take a moment to actually praise God for that struggle. Give thanks even for the struggle itself, and, and praise God and rejoice for the, for the journey itself. As Christmas approaches and we celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us remember God's faithfulness to carry us through. And as we reach toward that summit, as we reach toward that goal, let us find joy in the journey and in God's presence with us as we go. Pray with me. Father, you, you love us so much. You love us so much that, that you took on flesh so that you could know us more, so that you could be Emmanuel, God with us. And you did this so that you could know more about how to reach into our souls and rescue us. And we thank you so much for your rescue, for your walking alongside us, for your carrying us, for your faithfulness to us. God, this time of year, let us, no matter if we are joyful 
in the journey or struggling through the journey right now, let us remember to take moments and rejoice in you for who you are, for your love for us. Oh God, we give you thanks and we pray also, God, for your presence in our lives, that we would walk with you. We know that you are so near to us. Help us to see your presence, to experience your presence, to feel you walking with us. That we would rejoice and give thanks to you in our journey. As we celebrate the coming of, of your son. God, allow us to just have joy and fill our hearts with joy unspeakable. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.